Now, 17 times every day, Muslims turn towards the first house ever built on earth, the Kaaba in Mecca, by Abraham and his son Ishmael, to say the following prayer. We seek refuge with God from the accursed Satan. We begin with God's blessed name, most gracious and most merciful. All praises and thanks is to God, most gracious and most merciful. Master of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship, and you alone do we seek for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not the path of those who have incurred your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. All right, let's begin. So right here we have a poster called, What is Islam? Who are Muslims? Now, for a lot of American people, you may not realize this, since this is an English-speaking and partially Spanish-speaking nation, that when you say the words Islam and Muslim, you're actually speaking another language. You're speaking Arabic. So one of the things that we'd like to do today is demystify these terms for those of you who don't speak Arabic. Okay. So one of the important things that we want to define is, you know, what is Islam in the first place? Okay. So Islam, a lot of people have told me, and I've heard over the years, that Islam means peace. Okay. Well. We would say as Muslims that Islam will lead to peace, right? But ultimately, the word Islam means submission. Now, what do we mean by that submission? Well, in a religious sense, we mean anyone and everyone, from this time all the way back to the beginning of creation, who surrendered and submitted their own will to the will of God Almighty, the creator of the universe. We would say that that person is practicing Islam. Interesting thing about this word, most of the major world religions are either named after their founder, they're named after the place on earth they originated, or the tribe of people from which the ori their religion came. In other words, at some point in history, an event occurred and a religion started. However, the word Islam in the Arabic language does not relegate any place, any person, any time in history. It only refers to an action, the action of surrendering and submitting to the will of God. And anyone throughout history who has surrendered and submitted to the will of God, we would say is a mu Islam. Anytime you put this Arabic letter mean before a verb, it means someone is doing that action. And because of that, the fact that this term does not refer to any time, place, or person in history, we would say that, for example, Abraham is a Muslim. We would say that, for example, Moses is a Muslim. We would say that Jesus Christ is a Muslim. And finally, of course, Muhammad is a Muslim, and all the people who followed them are Muslims. Because once again, these Arabic words mean to surrender and submit to the will of God. Now, those of you who come from the Christian tradition, you will know that in the book of Matthew, chapter number 7, Jesus, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, stands up to deliver his sermon on the mount. And in it, he says, in Christian language, that not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. So the will of God in heaven done on earth in human beings, and I won't drill this point any further, is Islam and the ones who do it are Muslim. Now, what do Muslims believe in? Well, we believe in the one unique, incomparable, transcendent, eternal creator. Whoa. Brother Isa, it's been a long time since I took the SAT. Can you unpack some of those terms for me? Well, what I'm trying to say, and I'll summarize it very easy for you, the 112th chapter of the Quran is very clear about what we mean when we say God. Okay? It says very clearly, Qul, say he is God. Absolutely one. Qul hu Allah ahad. And then it goes on to say, Allah who summit. God the self-sufficient, whom all depend. Lam yalid wa lam yulid. 
he was not born and he doesn't have children, and there is nothing comparable to him. So while I can tell you that there's pyramids in Egypt, and we've all seen them at some point, if I told you that there's pyramids in China, even if you haven't seen the pyramids in China, you can imagine them. But when we talk about God, you have absolutely no reference, and there should be no picture in your mind, no image, no nothing. Using Christian language and Jewish language, I would say, very much like the Torah explains clearly to us, that no image of God should be made, be it in the heavens or the earth or in the sea. There is nothing in this material world that is anything like God. And so, when Muslims say God, we are referring to the creator of the universe, most gracious, most merciful, forgiving, and always ready to accept repentance from his servants. And we believe in that same God, followed by Adam, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, the tribes of Israel. We believe in that same God that Moses and Jesus prayed to. And we believe, because our Prophet Muhammad made it clear, and the Quran makes it clear about these things, and says them verbatim. Okay? So that's a little bit about what we believe. Now, because Islam is a universal religion, meaning that there is no particular group of people who have preference in the faith. Now let me explain that to you for a second. Now I don't want to get too deep into this because Imam Ayyub is going to cover it in more detail, but basically there's a verse in the Quran that says, O mankind, God speaking here, we have created you from a male and a female. And we made you into nations and tribes that you would know one another, not despise each other. Indeed, the best of you in the sight of God is the most God conscious. Indeed, God is all knowing and all aware. So here we have very clearly laid out for us that it doesn't matter what language you speak, what color your skin is, or where you came from, or who your father or mother was, or what tribe, or any of these things, really your importance with God, whether you're man, woman, or child, has more to do with your own consciousness. Now, that being said, Islam is now practiced in pretty much every country on earth. As you can see by the diversity of the people here, many nations are represented, even in this mosque alone, including rednecks from Brown Summit, North Carolina, like Brother Issa. <laughs> now, in order for us to facilitate worship together, to facilitate communion with the Creator through a relationship, we must be able to unite. Because we don't all speak English, we don't all speak Arabic, some of us may speak Urdu, some of us may speak Farsi, it doesn't really matter, but certain things we unite around, like the name of the Creator. Okay? So, when we refer to God Almighty, capital G, we usually call God by His personal name, Allah. Now, for those of you who come from the Jewish or Christian tradition, it shouldn't be anything new. I could ask you, for example, what language did Jesus speak? Aramaic. Aramaic. Okay, he didn't speak Latin, he didn't speak Greek, he didn't speak English. Okay, so in the language of Aramaic, he didn't say God. Okay, <laughs> he said a word that is very similar to Allah, Allah. And also in Hebrew, you also have the word Elohim. So Eloh, Allah, Allah, all referring to the same creator. And I'll make it easy, even easier for you to understand. It's kind of like here in America. Up north they call it a cat, and down here we call it a car. But we're talking about the same thing. Easy enough. Feel free if I'm talking over your head. Okay, so moving along from the name of the creator, and you guys just feel free to crowd around me. Remember, ladies first. So, at this point, we're going to talk about sacred sources of Islam. And once again, if any of you are feeling fatigued at any point during this tour, you can either raise your hand or just have a seat in the chair and eventually get around us. What about sacred sources? Sacred sources. So when we talk about the religion of Islam, what we don't want to make the mistake of doing with a universal religion is looking at one particular people on earth and their practice of Islam and then painting all almost two billion Muslims with the same understanding. If we really want to be fair to the religion of Islam, then we should probably go to the sacred sources from which the religion is derived. Because at the end of the day, Islam is a book to the people to understand. It came with a scripture and a prophet to explain the scripture. So at the end of the day, this is what we can unite around, despite our different cultures and languages. So let's talk about that first source of Quran. Now, Quran, once again, is an Arabic word. Let's unpack and demystify. It literally means the recitation. 
that which is repeated over and over and over. This is the book from which we derive all of the important knowledge that we understand about this word. Now, Muslims, we would say that this is God's actual speech, okay? Or in maybe Judeo-Christian terms, God's word. But maybe not the same way a Christian or Jew would use that term. What I mean by that is that, for example, if we compare the Quran and the Bible and whatever similarities they have, we can understand this. Okay, so the Bible, for example, is, you know, 66 or 70 plus books written over the course of 3,000 years in four different languages. Okay? And in that book, Muslims would say, without any problem, that God has certainly spoken to mankind in certain places. For example, in the Torah, God says, Shema Israel. Adinoi Eloheinu, Adinoi Jephah. Hear, O Israel, and your Lord God is, your God is one. This is a clear statement I don't think any Muslim would have any disagreement about. Right? But also we know from the actual makeup of the sentence that God is speaking in first person. However, we also have in the Bible not only God speaking in first person, but prophets speaking on God's behalf. For example, we have Jesus, peace be upon him, saying, This is salvation, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. Here we have Jesus, the messenger of God, the Messiah, speaking here to the people on God's behalf. But we also have a third type of writing, and that is people writing about God and God's messengers. For example, we have Jesus walks up to a fig tree thinking he would find figs there upon him, but it was not yet the season for figs. Here we have someone writing about Jesus, peace be upon him. When Muslims say the speech of God, we mean that the whole book is actually God talking in first person. Meaning that he's talking directly to humanity through his angel Gabriel, who brought this message to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon both of them, and that that is all God speaking. The other sources that we have in Islam are called a hadith, and these are what Prophet Muhammad said. Now all of these things, of course, are coming from the Creator, but we don't mix these into one book. The Quran is not the Muslim Bible, okay? We don't have solo scriptorum in Islam, but we do have this whole other section of writings, tens of thousands of statements and actions and observances of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay? So always understand that we don't just use this book, okay? We also use a whole set of other books to explain our faith. Now, the Quran. The Qur'an is one of the reasons Muslims have faith in Islam. I mean, it's one thing to say I was born and raised into a religion, and I just happen to believe that wherever I ended up on the earth and whatever my parents had is true and correct and acceptable to me, right? But if one wanted to move beyond simply inherited faith to a point where one actually believed in their religion because they actually wanted to be a part of it, one of the things that would increase their faith as a Muslim would be the miracle of the Quran. Now, if I were to ask anyone here today the following questions. Write me a book in the English language. Am I asking for something incredibly different or difficult? To write a book in the English language, is it really that hard? I mean, is it a humongous task? I don't think so. Why? Well, even if you, let's make it a little more difficult. Write me a 600 plus page book. A little bit harder, right? It's a lot of pages to fill, but still a lot of reference. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Now write me a 600 plus page book, but you cannot use any references. A little bit harder, right? All these ideas would definitely need to be original. All right, one last time. Brother Easy, you're killing me. Okay, so this one may knock you out. Write me a 600 plus page book in the English language, no references, and you can't write it with your hand. You have to recite it, and you can't make any mistakes. How's that book coming? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what the Quran is. When Prophet Muhammad comes in the 6th and 7th century to the Arab people, there are no books written there. In fact, the majority of the people in the land can't read and can't write, save a few. 
And what happens is, in no less than 23 years from the time he comes and claims to be a messenger at 40 until he dies around the age of 63, this entire 600 plus page book in the Arabic language is revealed to him in piecemeal and completed. And he can't read or write. And that's agreed upon, whether you're a Muslim or you're an Orientalist, non-Muslim scholar. No one believes that Prophet Muhammad could read or write. So this miracle is one of the proofs that Prophet Muhammad came with, so that people would understand that he's a legitimate messenger of God. You see, if I wanted to tell you today I'm a messenger of God, right, well, you might want to see something miraculous, right? I mean, I'm speaking on the behalf of the creator of the universe. So you have, for example, Moses. He comes with all these signs to prove to Pharaoh that he's a messenger. And eventually he splits the sea with a staff. Miraculous, right? Fast forward a few thousand years, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, comes. He does some things for the people, like raising people from the dead, and curing the blind, and curing lepers, walking on water. You know, if someone claimed to be a messenger of God and I saw them do those things, I'd be willing to accept that. I don't know about you. So what is the miracle of Prophet Muhammad? It is the Quran, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a living miracle, by the way. Um, all the other miracles would really be what I would call faith claims. I can't go back and show you Moses splitting the sea. I can't show you Jesus raising someone from the dead. But I can show you this Quran, still preserved in the original Arabic language that has never fallen out of use. Still one of the most amazing books in Arabic. In fact, Arabs use it to derive their syntax and grammar. All right, that's enough about the Quran. Moving along to Hadith. Okay, so God speaks in the Quran. We would say this is a manual for how to be a human being. And then the Prophet Muhammad, what is he? Well, any complicated device that you buy, for example, an iPad, okay? If I were to buy an iPad, it's a complicated device. I would say that's analogous to a human being with a complicated device, okay? If you go to a store, a complicated device always comes with a manual, right? I mean, no doubt. No one's going to expect you to know how to use it. But if it's really complicated, it will usually come with a demonstration also. Because the store clerk doesn't expect you to know how to use it. So the demonstration of the manual in Islam is the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. And we never divorce these two from each other. No matter what the Quran says, we're always going to look at how he understood that. Okay? That way we never end up in a situation where we're reading this book and we don't understand its context. Make sense? Difficult to understand? I hope not. Okay, now what about Prophet Muhammad's sayings? Well, if I wanted to say something about the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, well, I have a criterion to me. So, I want to say, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. He said, if you eat cantaloupe once a week, you'll live to be at least 100 years old. Okay, Brother Isa, that sounds great. I love cantaloupe. Where did you hear that? Oh, well, I think my dad told me. Okay. Where did he hear that? Probably from my grandfather, but I'm not sure. You're not sure. Because in Islam, we don't take statements about our prophet unless you can tell me every single person back to him. Their names, where they were born, what language they spoke, what age they were when they narrated this statement to you. And if all these things don't line up perfectly, if there's any weakness in that chain of people, then we'll take that statement and put it into a category called weak. Meaning that it may be true, but we can't prove that with any degree of certainty. But if all of those things line up, if all of these people who narrated this until today are credible, they had good memories, you knew their names and their birthplaces and all of these things, the knowledge of the people narrating it, then I can certainly apply that to my religion just like I do the Quran. But if you don't have that chain, then we can't say it's absolutely what Islam should be. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him. Imam Ayyub, God willing, will tell you a lot more about him, so I'm not going to focus too much of my attention on him today in this part of the tour. But basically, we have an orphan born in the 6th century Arabian desert in a city called Mecca. Okay? He had a mother and father, of course. He wouldn't be in this world without one. He was definitely a human being, no doubt. But what we have in his lifetime is 
a person up until about the age of 40 who's no one extremely special in society other than known for the following two qualities. Asadiq al-Amin, the trustworthy and the honest. In other words, out of the whole city, the Arab people in Mecca knew that out of all the people we know, Muhammad is probably the most trustworthy worthy guy that we can possibly think of. To the extent that they would actually store their expensive goods with him when they would go on journeys. So he was as trusted today and hopefully more trusted today than a bank. Okay? At the age of 25, a wealthy businesswoman named Khadija, may God's peace and blessings be upon her, she caught the eye of this honest young man and asked him to do some business for her. She was a 40-year-old widow, but very wealthy. So he went and did some business for her with, mer with merchandise in Syria, came back, made her more money than she'd ever had before, and then she decided to propose to this man. So, Prophet Muhammad's first wife, his boss. At this point, they begin to have a normal married life like anyone else. They have some children. But Prophet Muhammad, from the age of 25 on to 40, becomes very disenchanted with society. You see, at his time in history, we know that far enough back in history, a few thousand years, Abraham and Ishmael, monotheists, no doubt, they built the Kaaba, the first house on earth ever to worship the Creator. And that originally, that Creator would have been the very same Creator that we find in the Torah, you know, transcendent, eternal God. However, after all these thousands of years of no additional messenger coming to the Arabs, we have them now sticking about 360 idols in the Kaaba because they no longer believed they could have a direct relationship with the Creator, but they needed to pray through holy people or holy objects in order to get to the one true God. So he became very disenchanted with this. He began to leave Mecca, and he would go and meditate. Now, he went to a cave right outside of Mecca, which you see in this picture. And one night, he had someone call out to him in the darkness. Iqra! Now, he wasn't expecting a guest. The word rang with him, you know, read? I can't read. I, I'm not a reciter of poetry. And again, the voice crying out to him again, Iqra! Read! I can't read. I'm not a reciter. Again, Iqra! Read! I can't read. I'm not a reciter. And then finally, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Who created mankind from a clinging clot of blood in his mother's womb. Read in your Lord is most generous. Who created for mankind the pen. Created for mankind that which they knew not before. And thus we have the first five verses ever revealed of the Quran. And eventually the command to the Prophet Muhammad. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, hum fa'anvir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir. O messenger wrapped up in sheets. Stand up and warn people and glorify your Lord Most High. Now, moving along. One of the things that you want to understand before you leave here today is okay, you understand the mind of the Muslim, what they believe and understand. But what about the things that you guys do based on those beliefs? Well, the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, he came to demonstrate what the Quran is that in order to be a part of the religion of Islam, it's so easy for you. All you must do is make a statement of faith that you firmly believe in. And that statement is what we call the shahada, the witnessing. In Arabic, it sounds like this. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. I bear witness, I testify openly among any and all that there is no deity worthy of worship except God. And I additionally bear witness that Muhammad is God's messenger. Meaning that, according to that statement of faith, now I will only worship the Creator alone, and I will not partner anything with Him in worship. And I will follow 
Muhammad, the messenger of God, as to what that's supposed to look like. Anyone who says that statement of faith, you are our brother and sister in Islam. Now, everyone's our brother and sister in humanity. But you take a step into the faith when you make that statement. And so about seven years ago, I walked into a mosque just like this. I didn't have to do that. But I came, and I made that statement in front of the Muslim people, and I was greeted as their brother in Islam. Now, anyone who makes that statement, you have now entered into what we call a covenant or contract with God. Every messenger of God comes with a covenant or a contract. Basically, you do these certain things, and God, the creator of the universe, is obliged to give you forgiveness and mercy on the day of judgment. So one of those things is that we must pray five times a day. Now, if you're coming from the Judeo-Christian tradition, right, prayer is something, at least from my own Christian experience growing up, it's just basically turning to the Creator, glorifying Him, and asking Him for the things that you need. Okay? Muslims can do that any time of day. There's no set time for that. Or any set ritual. But when we say prayer, we're actually talking about something called salah, which, God willing, if you stick around until 2 o'clock today, you will see our second prayer of the day, and we hope that you will observe that. This salah is a physical, mental, emotional ritual in which you completely focus on God Almighty. You stand before Him and recite His words that He has revealed to the Prophet Muhammad and then to all of us. And then you bow and you prostrate with your head to the ground, just like Jesus. Christ, peace be upon him, just like Moses, peace be upon him, just like Abraham, and all the children of Israel. May God, peace and blessing be upon him. In that particular ritual, what you are accomplishing is a real connection with God through no one. Now, I'm not saying that we're divorcing ourselves from the ritual the prophet kind of taught us. No, you must do it his way, but you're not worshiping him. You're worshiping God. And you don't need to go through anyone to get to Him. Even though in prayer we may have someone lead us, that person is only facilitating when movements take place. And as you can see, whenever this tour is finished, we will pack all these posters up. This room will be empty of any image. And we will have nothing that we pray to except the transcendent, eternal creator of the universe, or as we call him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God of God. Next in line would be charity. Muslims are required to give a certain percentage, around 2.5% of our savings, directly to the needy. Meaning that if you're a person of God Almighty and get wealth, then if you are able to hold on to that wealth for at least a lunar year, you must reassess the amount and take 2.5% out and give it to needy people. Those needy people can be Muslim, they can be non-Muslim. Okay? In that particular situation, what is happening? Well, God Almighty tells us in the chapter called the Dominion in the Quran, He says that we indeed created death and life to test mankind as to who is best indeed. So from the Muslim perspective, everything that we go through in life is a test, whether it's riches or whether it's poverty. Because we believe in a day of judgment when God will bring us back to life and question us about the things that He gave us. So if you happen to be a person who had wealth, that may not necessarily have played out well for you in this world if you didn't spend it correctly. It could be a reason for you to deserve punishment. And if you were poor, well guess what? You have nothing to account for. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad said in some narrations that the poor enter paradise 500 years before the rich. So this idea of whether you are a have or a have not in this dunya, the life of this world, all becomes very fair and relevant in the next life because as adult, God, the just, only judges people on what they have, what they were given, what they understood, what their capabilities were. That's why his judgment is perfect. Next in line will be, and this is coming up, God willing, and may God give us life until then, in about two weeks, the month of Ramadan will begin. This is a month that for about 29 or 30 days, depending on how the moon fills that year, Muslims will abstain from food, drink, and any type of sexual activity from dawn until sunset. Now, hear me out, because I always get this question. You guys fast for a month straight? No, dawn to sunset every day, okay? After sunset, before dawn, you can eat and drink and enjoy the pleasures of life, for sure. But what God is trying to achieve with this particular command 
is that we have taqwa, God consciousness. You see, eating, drinking, procreating, they're definitely part of life. There's no taboo about them in Islam. But we don't want these lower level material passions to become a god. Meaning that they're the only real concern in this world is just obtaining material things, pleasures, sexual activity, and that's the meaning of life. Okay? God tells us to abstain from those things from dawn to sunset for that month so that we understand what it's like to be poor, so that we understand what it's like to be focused on the Creator and not the things He's created for us to enjoy. This is Ramadan, and we hope you'll come back on one of the nights to Meshit Hamza. I believe, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, they have an iftar dinner every single night here at this Meshit, or at least on the weekends, and it's an excellent time to come and be with the Muslims. The very last pillar of Islam, number five, is the pilgrimage, okay? The pilgrimage is called Al-Hajj. The Hajj pilgrimage, Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks to God, I got to do this year. This is where Muslims from all over the earth, black, white, Mexican, Asian, man, woman, child, king, popper, educated, non-educated, it doesn't matter. We all come to the same very hot place on earth, seeking the forgiveness of God Almighty, completing the ancient ritual started by Abraham, the pilgrimage to Mecca. It takes about two weeks. It's only to be done once in your life as an obligation, but more if you can, and only if God has given you the means to do so. In other words, if you spent your whole life poor and unable to make the pilgrimage, God won't question you about it on the Day of Judgment. He's fair and just. We would only expect that from our Rahman, our Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. This pilgrimage is the real living sign of the truth of Islam. You see, if Islam is a universal religion from the universal creator, as Muslims claim, then it should have signs and proof for mankind. Here you have the largest ritual of human unity that still takes place on this earth. I've been there and seen it with my own eyes. People from every language and culture and background, man, woman, child, every shade of color, every shape, coming together, getting along, seeking the forgiveness of God, worshiping together, together. And you'll see just a piece of this today, God willing, if you stick around for it. Now, let us move to the last section of the tour. Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks to God. You guys already ate, so I don't have to worry about the smell of food distraction. 